Hi, it's Jamie Batts, your instructor for AMP2. We're going to jump into chapter 26, which is the last chapter of our semester. It covers the reproductive system. Um, we're going to jump in. Where's the PowerPoint? That's not it. This is it. Okay. I have too many windows open on my computer, as usual. So let's skip through these outcomes and let's jump right in. We are just a quick overview. Um, both genders have, you'll see as we go through each gender, there's para parallelities. Oh my gosh, my vocabulary is terrible lately. Um, there are parallelisms, maybe that's the right word, <laughs> between male and female genders in terms of the reproductive system. So both genders have what we call gonads. Those are the actual hormone producing organs, the testes or the ovaries, right? And then there's all of these accessory glands and organs that are associated with it that are there to support the gonads as well as to promote fertilization and or um, fetal development. There's also the perineal structures, which are the external genitalia um, that are characteristic of both genders. So the male gonads are the testes or testicles, same difference, right? They're the same exact thing. Um, they are producing the gametes, male gametes are the sperm, technically called spermatozoa. They also produce hormones. Uh, the hormones that are produced by the testes, and we'll get into this eventually, um, they are basically responsible for nurturing the sperm and um, fueling the spermatozoa development and maturity. And then the male reproductive tract is there to support or rather transport the semen, which is the sperm plus all of the other secretions that go into it out into the external environment. So let's talk about some of these accessory organs in the male reproductive system. You have the ductus deferens. Uh, the ductus deferens, which is formerly known as the vas deferens or the sperm duct, um, Every couple of years, anatomists will go through and they change the names of some of these things. So if you think back to good old high school health, uh, you probably learned it as the vas deferens, but it's now known as the ductus deferens or the sperm duct. This is bringing the sperm from the epididymis, which is right around the testes, um, and the prostate gland, kind of bringing them out uh, of the body. Um, or out towards the urethra, I should say. Uh, the seminal glands themselves are... Um, secreting into the uh, ductus deferens and it's basically secreting different enzymes and nutrients to help support the sperm, um, to help them live through the male urethra and female reproductive tract. And then the prostate gland also secretes fluid and enzymes as well. The urethra itself is getting the semen to the outside of the body and the epididymis is a site right near the testes, which is where the sperm mature. It's kind of like the final destination for the sperm um, as they're maturing. So external genitalia, obviously we have a penis and a scrotum. Should be somewhat familiar with these at this stage of your life. Uh, the penis has the erectile tissue and that's obviously the vessel for depositing sperm into the female reproductive tract and the scrotum holds the testes. There you see everything, the ductus deferens, seminal glands, um, and the prostate gland all located right around the male bladder, which is not in this image. Uh, there's also a bulbo urethral gland and um, a few other glands in there that we'll look at um, on the models in lab. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. We're gonna look at how the sperm are matured and how they, whoops, and, and, and kind of where they go. So overall, the testes are where the sperm are created, and we're gonna look at this process of sperm creation. They go to the epididymis, which is where the sperm will finish their development and become um, not motile yet. They, they're not quote unquote swimmers just yet. Um, but they're finally ready to be um, ejaculated or, or, you know, released into the external environment. So they'll travel through the ductus deferens and then go through what we, we call the ejaculatory duct, which is just this little pathway between the ductus deferens and the urethra, um, and then out of the body through the urethra. So there's accessory organs that are secreting other fluids into the tubes along the way, the seminal vesicles, the bulbar urethral glands, the prostate glands, all secreting into the sperm to create the semen, and this is going to create a nice 
environment for the sperm to survive as well as nutrients for the sperm to ingest so that they have energy so that they can actually swim and get to where they need to go. <coughs> Here's a nice sagittal section so you can see all of the male anatomy from this view. If we start down here at the testes, right, located in the scrotum, the epididymis is kind of like a big catcher's mitt surrounding the testes. And um, the testes, as we'll see, are full of highly coiled tubes. The sperm, spermatozoa, are developing there, and then they go into the holding tank of the epididymis. They can sit there and wait and wait and wait for ejaculation to occur for them to be released. So the epididymis is the site. It's like that holding tank. Um, as uh, the sperm are getting ready to be released, they will flow through that ductus deferens. Check out the pathway of this ductus deferens. It doesn't just kind of zip up through the scrotum and directly to, um, to the urethra. It goes up and around and behind the bladder. Look how it actually is wrapping behind the ureter. So males, when you go and if you go to have a vasectomy, what they're actually going to do is they're going to make a small incision, typically, um, on the scrotum, and they're going to grab the ductus deferens and pull it down. And you're going to feel it in your lower abdomen. You're not going to feel it so much in your scrotum. They're going to be pulling this down so that they can take a section of that ductus deferens out. Um, sperm will still be created. It just won't be flowing through the tubes anymore. So uh, you can also see here, the seminal glands, you can see that ejaculatory duct, which is carrying the, the semen, which has secretions from the seminal glands, and the sperm from the ductus deferens into and through the prostate. It's going to merge with the, the urethra here. This is the prostatic urethra. And um, then it's going to obviously travel down the rest of the urethra out of the body. So these testes have the shape of a kind of flattened egg. Um, they're very small in size, um, and they actually form inside the body cavity right next to the kidneys during development. And the connective tissue bands kind of hold them together. And then later in fetal development, those connective tissue bands kind of release and allow the testes to um, kind of pull through the abdo abdominal cavity and um, migrate down into the scrotum. Uh, typically happens after um, birth. So here you can see um, the testes developing two months after conception. This is, so this is in utero, in utero, and then at birth, they're slowly descending down into the testes. Um, and that's because the process of being born is very stressful, and the testes are very delicate tissue. So um, as the baby's kind of being squeezed out of the birth canal, if those testes are descended at that point, they could be damaged. So um, kind of like an evolutionary mechanism there to keep them kind of high and tight, so to speak. Um, the scrotal cavities house the testes. There's a septum, which divides the right and left cavities of the scrotum. It's marked by a kind of thickened band called a raph or a raphi um, on the scrotal surface. There's a dartus muscle and the cremaster muscle. The dartos muscle is a smooth muscle on the skin of the scrotum, which allows for um, the testes to... Uh, kind of come closer together and the scrotum to wrinkle up on itself. And this is all for temperature regulation to keep the testes and sperm at a nice um, cooler temperature than the rest of your body. And then the cremaster muscle is actually going to um, kind of raise and um, depress the testes during different times um, of, of the day or di different activities that you're doing. The um, testes will actually can actually go up into the body or come back down, depending on the temperature, really. Um, their spermatic cords are um, special connective tissue structures made of fascia and muscle that are enclosing and um, enveloping the ductus deferens and holding all the blood vessels and nerves and lymphatic vessels in place. There's also something called a superficial inguinal ring, which is um, guarding the entrance to the inguinal canal, kind of at the top of the scrotum just there as another barrier. The, this inguinal canal is um, the point of inguinal hernia. So when the visceral tissue or organs, say from like your abdomen, like your, your small or large intestine, they can actually protrude through this inguinal canal um, if this uh, 
layer of connective tissue is in fact damaged in some way and um, those organs can descend into the scrotum very painful um, and obviously a quick surgery to sew that back up is um, in need at that point. So here you see some of these structures. You see the inguinal ring is this layer, extra layer of connective tissue which is allowing these um, muscles to um, extend down into the scrotum and um, you see that the whole um, scrotum and testes themselves are enveloped in this muscle and connective tissue protecting them. The septum in the middle, there's some uh, structures of the spermatic cord like the nerve, the artery, the veins, and the ductus deferens all kind of bundled up there together. Kind of like how everything has that hilum or that point of entry. It's the same idea here with the spermatic cord. So let's talk about the internal organization of the testes themselves. There's something called the tunica albiginia. This is the outer fibrous capsule. It covers the testes. It's continuous with the septum, um, and it actually form, it invaginates and divides in so that the testes can be broken into lobules. There are seminiferous tubules, which are the coiled tubules that are within the lobules. So these are fairly long, right, like a half mile long per testy, which is just crazy when you think about how small they are. And this is where the sperm are actually made, in these seminiferous tubules. They're going to merge together into straighter tubules and eventually come together um, and empty into that epididymis. The reet testes is the kind of merging, kind of uh, think of it as like all of the on and off ramps of a highway where all of these seminiferous tubules are coming together and um, it's right before the merge into the ep epididymis. Um, the efferent ductules take the reet testes into the epididymis. Here you see what I'm talking about, all of these different terms, right? So you have the tunica albiginia, this outer covering protecting everything. Inside you have your seminiferous tubules, which are coiled, coiled, coiled. Notice it's all divided into lobules. It's just invaginations or in foldings of this connective tissue. It's all to compartmentalize everything. Um, and then the seminiferous tubules all eventually dump into smaller straight um, tubules and then into the reet testes and into the efferent ductules, which are taking the sperm into the epididymis structure. I'm trying to see. Yeah, so the reet, the, everything's labeled on here. The reet testes, the straight, tubules, the efferent ductules, the epididymis. Those are the main, main ingredients there. Um, I'm going to actually stop the video here so that you have a chance to go back and review this section on male anatomy. And then in the next section, we will cover how sperm are formed. See ya.